Well, hello, my beautiful friend, and welcome back to Catching Your Breath, the podcast. I'm your host, Steve Austin. Hey, right here at the top of the show, I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing, for rating and reviewing this show. We just hit a little milestone a few weeks ago. We hit the 10,000 download milestone, and that's just the beginning. But it's all thanks to you. So thanks for listening. Today, we're going to talk about hope. (laughs) Hope, yeah. What a crazy thing to talk about right now, right? (laughs) It's the end of the world as we know it. So let's talk about hope. I'm glad you're here. Can I just tell you, I can't think about anything else other than the tension that rests between hope and despair. I think that the space between those two polarities, hope and despair, I think it's where we all live right now. Most of us live right now. It's where I'm living right now. Maybe I should just speak for myself. But I also think that that space between hope and despair is where humanity has the most potential. So sure, there's the potential to give in to the lies, to give up, to listen to shame, to stop dreaming, to meld into the status quo, to resign ourselves to just existing. But isn't there also the potential to rise above the chaos and be a force for healing and peace? Isn't there as much of a potential for our hopes to be actualized as there is for them to be dashed? Look, I I don't know how much I'll actually teach you today. I like to come into this thing with practical steps you can walk away from, but I hope to encourage you today at the very least because We're living in scary times, unpredictable times at best. And there are times when the information we're being given, especially around the coronavirus, around COVID-19, it seems to change by the hour. And then you've got all the other things going on in your world on top of a global pandemic and social isolation. If you're like me, you're writing two books and trying to be a good partner to your spouse and you're raising children or maybe you're going to school or maybe you've lost your job and you're reeling from that. Who knows? But for many, for most of us, our entire way of life has been upended in the last 10 to 15 weeks. I know mine has been completely upended. And in the midst of all that uncertainty, the fear the grief, the anger, it's really easy to think, man, maybe I'll just give up. Like, Why should I even hope anymore? What's the point? And I don't want to skip over any of that. The pain that you're feeling, the fear, the anger, all of it's valid. All of it. It's all valid. So, Instead of numbing it with busyness or addictions of whatever kind, why not lean into those feelings? Why not ask anger what it's trying to teach you? Perhaps you invite fear over for dinner and listen to its logic. Maybe you should call up your uncertainty and ask it to tell you everything. But just for a bit, don't stay there too long. Listen to them. Sure, lean in. The discomfort is good for you. But then I want you to remind all those emotions that you have to move forward 
and live your life because otherwise they control you instead of just doing their job, which is just to be a messenger. So at the end of this episode, I'm going to lead you in a guided meditation and teach you how to self-soothe when you're having a, a particularly rough day. But before we get there, I want to teach you three myths about hope. If you're a newsletter subscriber, some of this is already, it's going to be familiar to you. But I think these are worth noting. So myth number one, hope equals optimism. Well, friend, I got to tell you, real hope is so much deeper than superficial, wishful thinking. It's more than just cherry-picked positivity. So one of the lead researchers on positive emotions, Barbara Fredrickson, has identified hope as the only positive emotion motivated by negativity. Let me say that again. She's identified hope as the only positive emotion motivated by negativity. So here's what she says. Hope is not the typical form of positivity that we know of. Rather, it comes into play when our circumstances are dire, when fear, hopelessness, or despair seem just as likely. <laughs> Hope comes into play when hopelessness seems just as likely. Hope shows up when fear is just as likely. Hope shows up in the midst of despair. And that's what I talked about right at the beginning of this conversation. It's that tension. The tension between this sucks and I just want to quit and this wild-eyed, I can't quite wrap my mind or my words around this hope that I have that things will get better. And what do I do in the tension between those? So myth number one, hope equals optimism. Myth number two, hope is always well-behaved. So if you grew up like me, hope was presented as bright and airy, light and cheerful. If hope had a color, it would be yellow. Hope lived on easy street and was everyone's best friend. But did you know that hope can result in anger? So sometimes we can hope for something so much that the deferment of that hope can send us into outrage. So we see this in the Bible. Jesus has this hope for God's children and it's not being actualized and it sends him into a violent outrage. He overturns tables. He cracks a whip in the very temple of God because Jesus is angry. He's pissed off that God's children were being oppressed by those in power. The American revolutionaries who went to war had hope for freedom. I see that same kind of hope in the protests and riots that have filled my news feed for weeks. So listen to these words from Dr. Martin Luther King from his I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. <laughs> out of despair comes hope. And we hope in the one who makes all things right. We hope in the one who makes all things new. Myth number three, only people with easy lives have hope. So this one's a biggie. 
I was texting with my dear friend Ed Bacon. He was on his way a couple of weeks ago to meet with the mayor of Atlanta. And Ed and I are talking about hope. And here's what Ed texted me. You cannot get to hope without going through lament. Lament often includes both grief and rage. The Psalms of Lament, like Psalm 22, always end in hope, trust, and love. But there are no shortcuts. Hmm. So these are some of the things that I'm thinking about as I'm working on this second book of the year. I'm writing a book called Slow Miracles. 99 Doses of Hope and Healing, and it's scheduled to release next fall with Broadleaf Press. So since we're talking about the new book, since we're talking about hope, since we are all so desperate for hope, how about a little excerpt from this new book? Here we go. It begins with a quote from Henry Nouwen from You Are the Beloved. Quote, How are we healed of our wounding memories? We are healed, first of all, by letting them be available, by leading them out of the corner of forgetfulness and by remembering them as part of our life stories. What is forgotten is unavailable, and what is unavailable cannot be healed. To heal, then, does not primarily mean to take pains away, but to reveal that our pains are part of a great pain that our sorrows are part of a great sorrow, that our experience is part of the great experience. I am a person deeply familiar with pain. I've been abused, at times neglected. I have felt great sorrow and stinging disappointment. I remember the dark days when my soul was tangled in knots but there were no more tears to cry. And then a light switched on and a voice from heaven said, you are my child in whom I am well pleased. And suddenly life was cheery and bright. The end. No, no, no wait, that's bullshit. Don't ever believe any snake oil salesman who tries to sell you some formulaic fill in the blank magic carpet ride prayer that will magically soothe your pain heal your wounds, take you from life to death in approximately three minutes and slap a permanent smile on your face as big as Texas. That's not the way it works when you've run out of hope. For the person who knows something of trauma with a capital T, even if you're like me and the abuse only happened once in preschool, Unfortunately, that sort of thing just keeps happening to you again and again, even if it's only in your mind. Only. There's a four-letter word. We can use only in all caps on television advertisements. But wait, there's more. Only is a word used car salesmen with slick hair and cheap suits use to lure you in the door. Only to take full advantage of you without even the common courtesy of lighting your cigarette before they send you and your new-to-you piece-of-shit clunker hobbling out of the parking lot for only 27.99% interest for only 96 payments. Only is a word used to make a terrible thing seem not quite so terrible. Only is a word used to cheapen a thing, no matter how wonderful or tragic. It only happened once. You were only four. Can you even remember that? He was only 17. Give the kid a break. Even if it's only memories in your head, could there be any place worse for all that pain to go and refuse to die? The flashbacks only happen in public restrooms, only in locker rooms, only on your birthday. Only at night when the light goes out. Only. If only it was that simple. I know what it is to reach rock bottom. The end of the rope. The end of hope. Pills on the counter. Pills in my hand. Pills in my stomach. And a Bible in my lap. 
try as I may, I'll never forget the day the wind ran out of my sails. It's awfully quiet there. Awful in the way our ancestors meant it. Filled with reverential fear, knowing death was but a blink away. Awful in the way we use it today. Terrible, unpleasant, less than desirable. There are no good words to describe such a silence that swallows up everything, sacred and profane. I remember lying in that hospital bed, freezing cold, looking out the window for a sign like Noah's rainbow, desperate to be rescued like Jacob's ladder, taken to heaven to be freed from the groanings of a miserable existence here on earth. Alas, I only saw gray skies and raindrops on the window pane. Hope, less. Less hope than I'd ever known before. And I'm not sure if it was the gentle conversations with my nurse or the way my wife convinced the ICU staff to let her stay overnight or my best friend driving two hours to be with me the next day or Gigi holding my hand or this crazy notion that just maybe those raindrops on that window pane were tears from heaven. But somewhere in the mix of all that hopelessness, I was wrong. Because all it takes is love, tiny as a speck of dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That tiny inkling of hope kept me hanging on. But hanging on is something I'd been doing for 29 years. I was skilled at the fine art of hanging on by a thread, a thread of hope. On the third day, poetic as it might be, alone in a hospital bed, the numbness in my legs was gone. The numbness in my heart was fading too. That day I felt a warm hand the size of God on my chest. And I heard the inaudible voice whisper, I'm not finished with you yet. 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 A three-letter word which holds far more power than a four-letter word, if you ask me. A three-letter word with the force of God behind it was the first whisper of hope I'd had in quite a long time. I'm not finished with you yet. You might be finished, but the I am is not. Not yet. Maybe you've surrendered your hope. Perhaps it's been shattered. But when your pain meets God's promise, miracles can happen. There are miracles of legs regaining their feeling in three days, and those are the ones we love the ones we pray for. But there are deeper miracles of the slower variety which come through difficult conversations on the therapist's couch. There are miracles that happen in little white pills we take every morning and night which allow our synapses to fire more accurately. Miracles which require painful honesty, shedding of all those heavy things which no longer serve us now that the threat of hope has appeared. It's only a thread of hope. And yet, that is all we need. So that's a very early excerpt from my upcoming book, Small Miracles, 99 Doses of Hope and Healing with Broadleaf Press. It is scheduled to be out fall of 2021. Look, if you're interested in more help with rebuilding your hope or reconstructing your faith or embracing your emotions, consider coaching with me. You can get all the details at catchingyourbreath.com. And for a limited time, you can get your initial coaching call with me for 47 bucks. So that's a saving of $50. Again, all the details are at catchingyourbreath.com. Now, I'd be honored to lead you in a guided meditation to help you self-soothe. So to get started, I'd invite you to find a still, quiet place, hopefully away from other people where you won't be disturbed. And you can lie down or sit up. You'll probably want to close your eyes. Wherever you are, just be still and comfortable. 
in this exercise, I'm going to highlight the very necessary skill of bringing awareness to something that feels self-soothing and protective to you for those times when you really need it. So even when you're incredibly busy or maybe you're intensely stressed out, there are ways, several ways to find to self-soothe yourself, to feel safer, to feel more cared for, to feel calm. So the first thing that I recommend when you're stressed out is simply to stop. Pause what you're doing as long as it's safe to do so and allow yourself to just be still. The next step is to breathe. Just notice your breathing in and out. Then just just notice what's going on in your body. What can you feel? What sensations do you feel? Then I want you to try to reflect. What's causing this emotion? Where is this coming from? How can I respond in a way that benefits myself and others in a compassionate way? And then the last thing is just to respond by doing what you feel is kind, responsible, and fair to yourself and others. And if you will repeat these exercises, you will see that you're beginning to decrease your stress, your anxiety, that resurfacing of your trauma over the long term. That's why it's a daily practice. And your body will thank you, my friend. These daily stressors take such a toll over time. Some other things you can try. Taking several long, slow breaths. Singing. Listening to music. Calling a friend. Going for a walk outside. Cooking a healthy meal. So, with all that in mind, I'm going to guide you through this mindfulness exercise with simple easy to follow, self-soothing guidance that will gently divert your attention away from distress, that will gently lead you to a peaceful focus, that will allow you to feel calm, to feel grounded, and to be able to, to choose the best response you can. So, are you ready? Got your eyes closed. Comfortable. Let's begin with a deep breath in. Hold it for a moment and release. It's a great time to readjust, loosen your neck, wiggle your shoulders, make sure you're good and comfortable. And let's take another big, deep breath in. Hold it. And release. Now, just be still for a few moments. Let your breathing return to normal. Just let it follow your body's normal ebb and flow. Notice your breathing. Don't have to judge it. It's too long, too short, too deep, not deep enough, none of that. Just notice your breath. Now 
Now notice your body. What's going on in your body? Do you feel tension anywhere? Tightness? Nausea? Cramping? Sore muscles? A knot? What sensations do you feel? Maybe you feel the air from the ceiling fan against your skin. And hopefully by now your breathing is pretty still. You've calmed down a bit. Now, where did this emotion come from? What's triggering this feeling? What's causing this emotion? Did you have a memory triggered? Did someone say something harsh to you? Did you read something? Was it the lyric in a song you just heard on the radio? Too much sugar, too much caffeine, too much alcohol, not enough water. Where's this feeling coming from? You can be honest. And once you've identified the feeling and where it's coming from, what's a compassionate way that you can respond that is fair to you and doesn't cause harm to someone else? What's a compassionate way that you can respond that is fair to you, that honors you, but also honors the other person? And the final step is just to do it. Do what feels kind, responsible, and fair to you and anyone else who might be involved. You have permission to sit here and breathe as long as you like. You are enough. You do enough. You have enough. You are smart enough. You are strong enough. You are talented enough. You are enough. Now, whenever you're ready, you can wiggle your fingers and toes, begin to blink your eyes, and bring your awareness back to the room around you. I hope this episode has given you some peace, maybe some confidence, perhaps a laugh or two. I really hope that it's encouraged you to know that you're not alone. We're all walking through this together, and we're all going to walk through the other side. Stay in touch at catchingyourbreath.com. Leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Tell your friends, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.